Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I am your host. The focus of this series is to show the amazing lives people live. The key word here is live. Everyone has a story to tell, and all stories are worth celebrating. Over the years, I've read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive? The goal of this program is to celebrate the lives of everyday Vermonters. If you would like to be interviewed or know someone who you think would like to be interviewed, please contact me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Now, I would like to introduce you to Carol Ricciti. Welcome, Carol. Thank Good you. Good to have you on the show. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. So let's celebrate your life. Great. Where, where would you <laughs> like to begin? Um, I guess we should begin at the beginning. Yes. Um, I was born in Connecticut. Um, in Waterbury, Connecticut, to two young parents. My father's side is Ita was Italian, and my mom's side French Canadian. Um, my parents met. Um, my mom was in high school. Well, they both were in high school. Excuse me, at a Catholic. Um, they both went to Catholic high school. Um, my mom went to all girls Catholic high school. So they met at some event at the church. Mm -hmm. Um, and my um, parents got married and had me when my, you know, my parents were both young. Yeah. So I had a pretty, you know, basic childhood, very happy. Um, you know, we went to the beach a lot as a, when I was young. Um, and then my parents had a little bit of a, um, fa a conflict and decided to move to Vermont to be closer to my mom and dad. Mm. And, um, and then when I was, I think in the sixth grade, my parents decided to end their marriage. So I was living in Vermont in a rural town with an unusual last name and um, you know parents that were not together anymore. Mm. So it felt a little different than the other right, kids. Right. What which parent did you live with at that point? I lived with my mom. My dad decided to move back to Connecticut um, to be closer with his family. Mm -hmm. He was suffering from substance use disorder at the time and um, I think he was a little lost, mm -hmm. I guess is the right mm -hmm. right way to say it. So how did you handle that feeling a little different? <clears throat> That's a tough, sixth grade is a tough time anyhow. <laughs> you know, I, I think I had some good friends that helped me through it. And definitely my mom's parents and my mom. Mm. You know, my mom has been my rock throughout my life mm. um, through some very difficult times and challenges. Um, I do remember there were times when we would, my mother, my sister, and I would sing, you mm. know, and... Um, we didn't have a lot of money, but we, I felt like we were happy. We lived on, right. near the lake, so there was a lot of time swimming, and so we made the best of, of what we had. That's great, and singing doesn't cost a penny. <laughs> no, <laughs> we sang a lot of songs, um, like um, that I, when, when I hear them now, I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> so I can remember, um, when we first moved to Vermont, <clears throat> just to say how different we felt, we lived, um, my grandparents bought a trailer um, for us to live in when we first moved to Vermont. And the neighbor said to me one time, your dad's a hippie. Mm. And I came home mm. and I asked my father, you know, so innocently, you know, what's a hippie daddy? Because he did, he had a big beard, you know, long hair, right, right. and um, he just said, "Educated people that um, older people are afraid of, or something like that." I can't, I can't, right, right. I can't quote him exactly. So, right. but anyway, <laughs> I, it was, it was the, you know, the '70s. Mm -hmm. um, so life was a lot different then. Mm -hmm. Did you, uh, when you think of your little, your young years, did you have dreams of what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, probably, I w always wanted to be a singer, you know, oh, in yeah, a band, a, yeah, or yeah. play in a band, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. 
um, or even a dancer. So my sister and I would listen to a lot of records um, and we would sing and we would dance. We had da dance routines for different songs. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Who was your favorite singer? Out um, there? Probably Fleetwood Mac, definitely mm. for sure. Um, and the Rolling Stones. I was a, I still am a huge Rolling Stones fan. We listened to a lot of Linda Ronstadt. Mm. Um, so, you know, a lot of the 70s music. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the Beatles. The Beatles, yes, yeah. of course. Sgt. Right. Pepper. Yep. Oh, yeah. well, that's terrific. Yeah. yeah. Have you continued singing as you've gotten older? <laughs> Definitely. So, um, I have, my daughter is now 23, and um, she went through a phase where she loved Taylor Swift. Mm. And when the Red Album came out, I can't remember, she might have been 12 at the time. We probably listened to the CD in the car at least 75 times. <laughs> I, can, I can probably sing every word now to, to the Taylor Swift <laughs> album. <laughs> so yes, that's, we still sing. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. that, did you, did, have you guys gone to see Taylor yes, Swift? Yes, we did. Of course. <laughs> I, we saw Taylor Swift when she was in Montreal, and it was so cute. My daughter and her friend dressed up um, as the cheerleader from the Shake It Off video. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're a big fan of Taylor Swift's. And um, so it was a really sweet oh. memory. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so uh, back to the sixth grader over there. That, oh, yeah, yes. So, so um, you know, we li my mom mm -hmm. moved. We lived in a log cabin, and we lived um, on the lake, as I mentioned before. Lake Champlain? Lake Champlain in Highgate Springs. Okay. And a lot of the um, houses in the area where we lived, it was called the Country Club, were all um, summer cottages mm. of people that lived in Canada. Mm. So we had some friends, Belinda and Lorraine, they lived right next door, same age. Uh, Belinda was my age, and Lorraine was my sister's age, and they were adopted. Um, I believe Belinda might have been from Jamaica, and I can't remember now where Lorraine was from. And um, so we would go to Montreal with them. They lived in Montreal, and we, so we just had a great oh, that's time. Wonderful. It was a very, um, yeah, it was a nice, nice childhood. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then my mom got remarried um, when I must have been around. I think a freshman in high school, um, and the first real traumatic event that I can remember in my life was that my um, stepfather tried to sexually um, assault me, mm. and um, mm. and I I don't think that that's an uncommon thing, unfortunately, to happen in families. Again, it was back in the you know 70s mm. and. Um, there wasn't a lot known about how to support women right. or, I mean, I was 16. I wasn't right. even a woman at the time. And so, um, unfortunately, I've, I've learned through therapy that after that event, it's not uncommon for girls to um, kind of go through a period where they're promiscuous and, you know, maybe push the envelope a little bit. Right. So I went to college. I went to Paul Smith's College for one semester, and at that time I was drinking a lot, and I wasn't, you know, really making an effort. I was didn't have a purpose. Um, so after that one semester, I, I um, left school, and I moved around a lot. So one time, my poor dad did my income taxes, and I had lived in three different states. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> he, it was a challenge. Yeah, I um, could see. Yeah. So hmm. I lived with my grandparents for a little while, my grandma and grandpa um, in Connecticut, Richuti, and that was a very special mm. time in my life. Mm. I can remember, mm. you know, my grandmother doing my laundry, ironing all my clothes. Mm. Um, just I felt cared for and safe. That's wonderful. Yeah. And you needed During that, that time. For sure. Yes. Yeah. I did. 
Yes. So, Kara, I, that's a, it's a tough situation that you went through. Did it, did, did, was it a secret thing? Did it come out? Did, did you get any validation of what happened to you? Um, so my mom did know, uh, I, and um, I can remember just kind of getting away from him, you know, running upstairs, um, going, running to the neighbors, but it stayed within our family. Mm -hmm. It didn't go, you know, past that. Right. right. Um, so yep. I just didn't get the, you know, unfortunately the help that I needed at yep. that time. Okay. Did the marriage stay together? Did they? Um, so my mom, they stayed together for a few more years, maybe 10 years. And then they, my mom and, um, her husband got divorced yeah. then. Okay. Yeah. But they did stay together after that. I think that they went to, um, counseling together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. That's for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. I've um, gone to a lot of therapy in my life. Like currently, I'm I'm actually going through EMDR, which is um, to support folks who have lived through a lot mm -hmm. of trauma. And I wanted to start with my why for sharing my story. So mm -hmm. I'm a survivor of domestic abuse, and the reason why I'm choosing to share it today is because I hopefully um, would like to support um, individuals who are in a um, abusive relationship and also hopefully to end stigma. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll hear in conversations, you know, why doesn't she just leave him? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping with me sharing my story um, that that'll end some of that stigma. Good for you. So before I start, I want to share that um, if you are in an abusive relationship, I would encourage you to reach out to Steps to End Domestic Violence. I can tell you um, the staff is very caring. They're wonderful people. You would just call the, the 800 toll-free line and there would be somebody there that could support you um, 24 hours a day. And also, if you um, feel after hearing my story that you'd like to donate to STEPS, they're having a, um, it's called the Kaleidoscope coming up on May 3rd. It's a fundraising event at Isham Farm, and you can go on their website and find out more information about that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So you went to college for a semester. Yep. And that didn't work out. Things were too, in too nope. much chaos at that point. Did you go back to school? I actually did go back to college. I went back when I was 37. So I had two children at the time. I was a stay-at-home mom through most of my children's life. Um, and so when my daughter went to first grade, I started college. And I graduated with a high GPA, which I'm really proud of, 3.65 yeah. GPA with two kids. Sometimes yeah. I got up at 4.30 in the morning so I could study. Jeez. And I have a um, bachelor's of education, elementary education mm -hmm. degree. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. I was really proud of myself um, for achieving that. I don't think I ever really felt smart. <laughs> and so just the point that I was able to um, go back to school and, and really I, I was, um, surprised with how much I loved it and mm. how, how easy it was for me. Mm. It sounds like you, A, you found the field that you really liked mm -hmm. and you were very focused. Yes, yeah. I was. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. different time in your life. And, Definitely. And it, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. How, did you teach after? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I actually graduated in South Carolina, and um, I did, um, when I did graduate, I was in the process of getting divorced from my um, ex-husband, and there was a hiring freeze for teachers mm. at the time in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. I did substitute teach a little bit, um, but I didn't stay. I stayed in South Carolina maybe 
a year after I separated from my my ex-husband, um, just trying to stay stay in the area, yeah. um, but it just wasn't meant to be. So then I moved to Vermont. Okay, kind of back home where the we had some roots. Exactly. That's yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, I met my first husband when I was in my twenties, and as I said, you know, really didn't have a lot of purpose. At that time, I was still a little lost, um, and he um, was older than me when we first met, you know, just kind of showered me with gifts and um, was very charismatic, and, um, you know, I just fell head over heels. And so I wasn't with him very long before we got married. You know, looking back now, there were a lot of red flags mm -hmm. when we were dating. He was very jealous. Um, there were times when there was some physical and definitely verbal abuse when we were dating. But um, we didn't we didn't know about red flags then, right? Right, right. So <clears throat> we got married and I had a son um, right away. Um, and you know, just being a young mom, my son was born premature, mm -hmm. and he was in the um, nephew unit mm -hmm. for I think about two weeks. And I can remember the first time that I really felt fear um, in my marriage was that when we came home, when my son came home from the hospital, um, he was having a hard time going to the bathroom. He may have been constipated. Mm. So I wanted to call the doctor. I was really worried. And he, my ex-husband started screaming, you know, he doesn't need to go to the doctor. You're just crazy. You, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm. And I literally ripped the phone from my hands and bent it. My goodness. And so I ran mm. next door to my neighbor and called the police. And I think that's probably the first time that I went into the fight or flight. Right, right. Um, yep. My mom came, the police came, um, and I ended up going and staying with my mom with my son for a few days. Mm -hmm. Um, there's one thing about women or men or anyone that's in an um, abusive relationship, you start to blame yourself. Mm. It's almost like they take every ounce of, of dignity and um, your self-esteem and um, you just mm. don't, you blame right. yourself. Right. So you were saying... What could have I done differently yes. to avoid this happening? Yes. Rather than, this is pretty yes. bad news. I blame myself. Wow. And another thing that I've since realized is that I always present myself as perfect. I want everyone to think I'm perfect on the outside. And I think there's two reasons why. One is um, I felt if I was perfect, then he would stop the abuse. Right. And the other is, I never wanted anyone to see what was going on inside my home. Mm. You know, I didn't want um, mm. yeah. anyone who may have been a friend or whatever to, to see what was going on. Yeah, yeah. Did you have, uh, your, it sounds like your mom was a confidant for sure. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Did you have other friends at that point when all this was going on? Um, I did not have a lot of friends at that point. Mm -hmm. um, some, you know, and I, I, I was just so young. Yeah. Anyone that would even, I did have friends, but I don't think anyone that would understand how to support me. Right, exactly. Right. And there weren't shelters at that point no. or anything like that. And, and, and you know, I just had a young child. Um, I, I wasn't working, you know, so there were so many reasons why I went back. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I know it must have been, I think about how difficult that must have been for my mom, mm. you know, 
has she ever shared? That must have been. Yes, a, she has. Yeah. Okay. And and my dad. I mean, I, I yeah. should I should tell to say my dad as well. Yeah. Um, so we ended up moving to Florida. Maybe when my son was about in two, I guess. And my um, ex-husband's mom lived in Florida, so we lived in Winter Park. Mm -hmm. And we lived there for two years. And I started really making friends then. Mm -hmm. You know, just had some good friends. Um, and there's always this grooming period or, you know, the honeymoon period where things go really well for a little while. And I think I can pinpoint that was a, you know, really good time. Mm. Um, my son was young, you know, um, my husband had a good job at the time and we were, you know, living a good life. Mm -hmm. Um, and then from there, we moved to Jacksonville, Florida for two years. He was transferred with his job. He was working as a general manager of um, a sports bar kind of restaurant. And then when we were living in Jacksonville, things started to kind of go in a negative way. He lost his job. Mm -hmm. um, I was just working part time because I was, he worked so many hours. We kind of made a, a decision t that I would be the one to stay home, you know, yep. to be with my son. Yep. And um, at that point, um, you know, things were just not that good in our marriage. I can just remember some, some things going on that just, you know, weren't um, that great. From there, we ended up moving to Greenwood, South Carolina, and I lived there probably for 15 years. Mm. And I was I was happy in Greenwood. I had a lot of very I had a lot of close friends. Um, I was a I had my daughter in in Greenwood. Mm. Um, I again was not working, um, and I volunteered a lot in my children's school. Um, so, you know, to be, you know, I actually ran, it was an Earth Day at my son's elementary school mm. every year. Um, I was the head of that and just, we had different activities that we did, which um, really made, you know, That's me wonderful. happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and along the way, there were different physical things that happened and, you know, my my ex-husband had a way of, he was taller than me and bigger than me, that if I didn't agree, he would stand in the doorway, I couldn't get out. Mm. Um, so it was, there were, it, you know, there was a lot of name calling, um, yelling, and um, During that time, you know, during that time, it was very stressful, you know, wow. screaming in the middle of the night. Um, you know, I was always fearful that it would wake my children up. You know, just it wasn't a good time. And I think I was becoming stronger as a person than the person that I was in the 20s when we got married. Right. And he probably was fearful that he was losing control mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And then when I went back to college, that's when things really started to get hard because he, you know, he was always said, you think you're strong, you're smarter than me. And, you know, which I ne never would think I was smarter than anybody. <laughs> um, so mm -hmm. that was, I think that was kind of the turning point. Mm. The more you became who you wanted to be, yes, <clears throat> the worse it got. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was very involved in my neighborhood. I was involved in my children's schools, and you know, and he always said, "You're the cheerleader of Greenwood," or you know, just if I bought the wrong kind of cream cheese, like let's say. For instance, I bought reduced fat cream cheese. I would come home from shopping and, you're so stupid, why did you get that cream cheese? Um, so just those types of things. I, one one <clears throat> particular incident that I can remember is 
I don't know why my ex-husband was so upset, but he stood up literally while we were eating dinner, threw a plate of spaghetti at me in front of both of my children. Oh. And I, I can remember thinking at that time, this is done, like I'm, I'm done, yeah. I can't take this anymore. Right. So I started sending my mom money, cash, hmm. in the mail. <clears throat> And I had asked him to move out. I was graduating in, in May from college. And I think this probably was uh, maybe in April or March. And um, I asked him if we could, I just needed a break, like if we could just separate for a little bit of time. And he said that he would look for a place to live because we, we had our, own house and my mom kept calling and saying he's not looking for a place to live mm -hmm. you know he's just not <laughs> mm -hmm. and so and I do remember my mom calling and literally you don't realize you're being abused a lot of times it just becomes so much your normal norm is right and that had been my normal for 20 years right. and she called me and started to say, you know, I think Stan is really abusive, you know, and I kept saying, no, I'm not, there's no way, you know. So she really had to convince me, well, not convince me, but kind of give yeah. me examples right, of, right. of. She was a reality check yes, for you. And exactly. you didn't, that's all you knew. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, so he, he wasn't looking for a place to live. I think at that point I might have sent my mom over the course of a year, maybe like 2000 or maybe $2,500. And so I had talked to an attorney um, and he said to me, when you're ready, let, you know, just give me a call. He had written up all the paperwork. Well, we, I had gone to my, ex-husband, my daughter and I, she had an activity at school and I can't tell you now what it was. It might've been a concert or something. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he started yelling at the both of us outside of the school. Hmm. And at that point I hadn't graduated from college. I was still, didn't have a job. I drove home and I decided that was gonna be the day. Mm -hmm. that I was going to call my attorney and um, let him know that I was ready. Yeah. Yeah. Well. So I ended up living with some friends of mine, a, a friend of mine, because I, I knew I couldn't afford the mortgage of our house. I didn't know where I was going to go. Yeah. I lived with a friend of mine with my dog and my daughter until I could find a place. Mm. And your son? did. Um, my son at that time was older, so there's okay. nine years difference between my son and my daughter. Okay. So he was actually in college at the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. So if I could go back for a second. Yeah. You know, after that first incident early on in your marriage, that was when the baby, you came home and the baby and what, how did that, the, how could how did you regain trust in your husband at that point, having having gone through that, or did or did you not? And just was that a I think a shift in the whole thing at that point. Um, I think because I have been diagnosed with PTSD, I don't think I knew that trust was a big part of a relationship. Isn't that sad to even say? Mm -hmm. um, probably from what happened with my stepfather, I may have started to um, have PTSD after that sure. event, sure. from the traumatic event. Um, sure. You, when you're in the fight or flight, and I probably lived like that for the whole time during my marriage, I, you don't think clearly. Mm -hmm. That's the whole <clears throat> point. Um, you don't, so there's so many thoughts that run through your mind for it. So now I'm able to control them, but you, I guess the best way to describe it is just sitting here 
at that time, I couldn't have thought clearly like I am now. It right. would be like, bing, ping, 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 you know, look at that camera, look at over here, oh, look at what he's doing. So you're not able to process what's right. going on. Okay, gotcha. Does that make sense? Yep. So you just kind of just go through the motions. You're in survival. You're, yeah. You're right. in survival. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. And you, you don't think about what's going on, you're just in survival mode. Right, right. Yep. And there was, and you got. Then fast forward twenty years, you got to a point where you said, mm -mm, "There's, I want more than this." Yeah. 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 I definitely did. Good for you. Yes. And you know, and this is what I really want to share because, um, I think this is the part where a lot of folks don't understand, who haven't had this in their lives is he didn't want me to leave. Mm -hmm. He did every single thing that he could do to prevent me from leaving. Mm. Financially, at the time I didn't, like I said, I was you know not working. Um, I went to the bank to get some money out of our joint account. When I went, the account was empty. Mm. Wow. So I was literally driving back to my home to go back to him because I didn't have a choice at the time. Mm. So I had to, to back story, I had given my attorney all the cash that I had sent my mom for, you know, the, the, um, for the lead to, right, yes. process the, the divorce. So right. I didn't have right. any cash. Right. I was literally in my car driving back to go back to him and my mom called me. Mm. And I can tell you that that point where I was standing at the bank, the, there was no money in the account. The teller was telling me that there's no money in the account was probably um, one of the hardest parts of well, that's not true. There were so many hard parts, but it was a really difficult part for me to the point where finances are still very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just the despair of knowing that I didn't have, I wouldn't have the money. Right. No money, no options. No money, no, at that point, no clothes, no, I mean, furniture, no, nothing. nothing. Right. Just my daughter, just right my daughter, my dog, and myself, right. and the support, thankfully, of my mom. Yep. And she, my mom called me when I was literally driving to my dad, uh, to, to home, and um, she asked me, what's going on, what are you doing? And I told her, and um, she said, well, I'm gonna send money to, t to my, I was living with my friend Tina, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say, send some money to Tina, I don't want you to go back. And that was my saving grace. Wow. And a lot of women don't have that. Right, right. Um, so right. that's why something like STEPS is so important. Right, right. Um, so I do feel so fortunate that, that I had that support and love. Mm. Um, and my friends, you know. Um, so from there, things just got worse, you know, he stalked me. One of my neighbors asked me, so I, I found, I was living in my own place after, I think I stayed with my friend Tina for two months. Still didn't have any furniture at that time. I had to go with a police escort to get my clothes because he wouldn't let me have my clothes. Um, I had to go with a police escort to get my daughter's bed, um, and when I went to get my daughter's bed, my friend was taking some of the sheets and pillowcases and different things that of my from my daughter's room, yep. and he said, nope. Wow. The only thing you take is the bed and the mattress. Wow. And the police were there at that point? Oh, yeah. Hmm. So the police actually said to me after we left, they said, you know, we've seen a lot of people in our lives, but that's really low, not to allow your daughter to have exactly. sheets and, you know. Right. 
I had friends that sent me money. I had friends that gave me furniture. I had friends that, I mean, I just can't even tell you the yeah. support that I had. Yeah. Dishes, you know, I, I didn't have anything. Um, but I had a determination and grit That's, in, yes. in, that I was going to um, not go back. That's right. So I ended up getting a victim advocate. I'm, I'm, I've decided I'm not going to share a lot of what happened. Some of it is too traumatic and I can't relive it, but I want to share two stories. Um, so my um, ex-husband <clears throat> couldn't go in my driveway to pick me up, he had, to pick up my daughter, he had to stay in the road. And every time he picked her up, you know, he'd say something about me, you know, visit, you know, having a playmate or some sort of thing, you know, trying to, I don't know what he was trying to do. So I was going, I was going out with some friends, friends of mine and you know, just happened to be, I thought that they had left. Well, he had parked, you know, a little bit further down so I couldn't see him with my daughter in the car. Mm. And I was dressed <clears throat> up to go out. And he got out of the truck and he said, where are you going? You know, and, and I'm like, it's none of your business, you know. So um, <clears throat> during that time, I had a job <clears throat> where I was working from home and he must have known my schedule. I'm sure he was, he was watching what I was doing. Actually, I know he was because at night he would climb over my fence that I had on my condo and move things around in the little courtyard that I had mm. just so I knew that he was there. Oh, dear. So um, the next day I went to pick up my daughter at school and a, a lot of times I left the door opened to the courtyard just because it was warm in the house or the dog would go out there, whatever. And I got back with Catherine and I tried so hard to protect her. I didn't want her to know what was going on. Mm. And my drawers were open mm. in my bedroom in my chest of drawers. Mm. Somebody had stole all my underwear, all my, you know, yeah. every, all my clothes, yeah. anything like that, and one pair, one of every pair of my shoes. Oh, jeez. All my dresses. So at that time, I had a victim advocate, and I called her, and... Um, you know, she said, well, you're going to have to call the police, you know. And I said, I know, I mean, nobody, nothing else was taken. Like, you know who must have done it. Right. And what a violation that was for me. Some of the victim advocate came with me, came over. The police, you know, kind of fingerprinted and everything to see if they could find anything. Um, and they never were able to pinpoint that it was him mm -hmm. um, so that was you know the, just it's almost like it's become such an obsession for um, abusers right. right he had lost control and damn if he wasn't going to try to make life miserable for you and you're not a person Right. You're just an object, and your children are pawns yeah. in, in the whole situation, which, you know, I don't think I really understood until I moved to Vermont. Just my daughter and my son were pawns for him. Yeah. Carol, I know you have one more story you want to tell, but how does that all that define you today? Who's Carol today? I can tell you that... Um, I am empathetic. I don't judge. I am proud of myself. Mm. 
um, you know, there was times throughout my marriage, I felt that somebody was carrying me. You know, I don't know how I did it to be in, in my divorce, quite honestly. Um, I, because of my PTSD, sometimes I grasp for words. I, and I've been so strong in the sense that I'm not going to let this define me. Mm -hmm. I continue to work on myself. I'm a high functioning person with PTSD. That can be a blessing and a curse. If people see me, they probably don't realize. And, um, and then I'll start stuttering or losing my, grasping my words. And probably people look at me like, oh, what's the matter with her? Mm -hmm. I'm very hard on myself. Um, and I think that's still part of letting go of that verbal abuse. Right. Um, I'm happy for the first time in my life right now. I can say that I'm happy. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. What helps you? How did you get to that place of being happy? What do you what have you done for yourself that allows yourself to ha be happy? Um, hard work. Mm. So I can right after COVID. Um, I went through a a very difficult time. I was um, I was married a second time, and um, I I think COVID and I'll just be honest, Donald Trump's presidency really had me triggered almost the whole time. Mm -hmm. A lot of his mannerisms and the way he speaks reminded me so much of my ex-husband. It was a really hard time for me. Um, so I started working at Working Fields, which I love my job. I think that's part of the reason why I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to end my life. Mm -hmm. So we were going to go for Mother's Day. Um, so this must have been two years ago. I was, my mom, my sister and I had planned a weekend to, to get away for the weekend for Mother's Day. I woke up in the morning. Um, my husband was still sleeping at the time, and I started to think, if I drive to New Hampshire, I'm going to drive off a bridge. Mm. I had just got to the point where I was so depressed and, and not in a good place. And, and oh. trauma does that to us. Yeah. It, it just builds and builds and builds until you, you have to confront it. Yeah, you have exactly. to, or it's going to eat you alive. Exactly. I'm so thankful for Mickey, who's the CEO of Working Fields. I, I had to call him and be honest. You know, I can't come into work. Um, you know, he, he said, take care of yourself first. Um, and I ended up going into an IOP program, Seneca. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great program. And that's when I really started, my life really started to change. Mm. I learned a lot of tools on how to help myself. Um, and now I'm doing, like I mentioned, the EMDR, yeah. which is just powerful. so, it's so powerful. Yeah. So when you are in the fight or flight or you have PTSD, you're not using what's called your wise brain. So EMDR um, is able to, you rework the trauma and it reprocesses your brain so that you're using your wise brain. Mm. So it's just amazing. I would suggest if anybody um, has gone through traumatic events in their lives that they, they um, seek that out. What does EMDR stand for? Do you know that? Um, we all, we've Rap, it, it's something about eye movement. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I can't think of it right now. That's but okay. but the, what I'm doing is not eye movement. It's two little electronic pulses on each hand. Mm. Um, so, but yeah, it's, wow. it's amazing. So you, you have taken the boulder of PTSD and made it a pebble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can drive past it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for sure yes I think I have you know and 
and family is so important to me. Mm. Um, you know, the support of my mom, unfortunately my father's not living, you know, on this earth anymore. Mm -hmm. So, but I know that um, throughout some challenges in my life, I felt him. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't say enough about family. Mm. You know, just how so the unconditional love. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Did you want to share the second story, or are, you, are we good? Yeah, I think I'm good. Okay. So, <laughs> so life. So you're getting a grip on this PTSD. Yes. What's life like now? What's what? You're happy. This I, is a good thing. Yes, I'm <laughs> happy. Um, I'm doing things that I used to do. You know. Um, when I was finding out who is Carol, you know, at yeah. 57 years old. Um, so I, I like to work out in the yard. I definitely exercise a lot. Um, I walk a lot. I'm starting to make some really close friends in St. Albans because I recently moved to St. Albans, well, two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so we, you know, going to a trivia night mm -hmm. once a week with girlfriends. And I also um, in, am dating a partner, somebody who um, understands me, and um, we've been traveling quite a bit together. So I'm I'm very happy. Good for you. Yeah, Good my daughter you. and I are very close. Yeah, I was going to ask you how the kids are doing. So you know, part of <clears throat> unfortunately, the my son saw the way that um, my ex-husband treated me and we are not, we are estranged, mm -hmm. unfortunately. It's been quite a while. Um, you know, I do reach out to him, but he doesn't respond back. Mm -hmm. I have a granddaughter, um, so he has a daughter that I have no contact with mm -hmm. whatsoever, which really quite honestly, hurts me to my soul. Yeah. Um, and my daughter, I can't be prouder of her for somebody who has lived through the trauma that she's lived through. Um, she graduated from college and she um, she's, you know, has a great job and she's doing mm. really well. That's wonderful. Yeah, we're very close. In Vermont? No. Okay. You know, she moved to, so she went to the University of Vermont, um, graduated from the University of Vermont, and ended up moving to Arizona with um, some of her friends because she just didn't feel that Vermont was affordable. Unfortunately, as a young Stop. person, yeah. yeah. But I'm going to go see her actually next week. Oh, God. Yeah, and when I told her I was going to oh, be God. on this show, she said, oh, Mom, I wish I was there so I could you know, stay and support you. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah, we're really close. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anything you would like to, to, say, to say to wrap up our show? Um, You're certainly a woman of courage and strength <laughs> and, like you, you said, grit. Thank you. And you've also showed a path for your daughter, um, but probably for a whole lot of other women out there. Um, yes, I hope so. I, I think that, you know, the only other thing that I would share, as I said before, is that it's not easy, um, but there's support out there from different agencies, especially in Vermont, you know, where I was living in South Carolina, and I can tell you that, unfortunately, the state is not set up to support women or anyone who's been in an abusive relationship. Like I can remember one time my attorney saying to me, I carry a gun with me, and the reason that I carry a gun with me is because of your husband. So, I mean, put that on a, a single woman, you know, a woman who's trying to get a divorce and has a child, you know, it's right. just like, right. okay, you're helping yourself, but what are you doing, you right. know, to support me, right? right. So, um, it can be done, and you will find, um, if you work on yourself, peace and happiness. Mm -hmm. 
Good for you. You want to mention one more time the organization that yes. women should check in with if sure. they need support? Steps to End Domestic Violence. Steps to End Domestic Violence. And I would, I would also ask if anyone is going to, you know, have the ability to um, give money to Steps, that it's a great organization and um, there's a need. Yeah. Are they here in Burlington? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Or, or Colchester. Okay. Sorry. Great. Well, thank you for coming. You're thank welcome. you for sharing your story. You. And it is a celebration what you what you've become going through all that you've been through. Thank you. I'm glad we could do this. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. All right.